Hello, and welcome back to the Star Trek Critic, where each episode is analyzed for plot holes, scene errors, and most importantly, whether or not the show has withstood the test of time. Today's episode is a taste of Armageddon, where an ambassador gets all snotty with his military escort and almost gets them all killed. Does this ever happen in real life? Oh no, it never happens. Not at all. The Enterprise is escorting Ambassador Fox to Iminiar 7 in an attempt to establish diplomatic relations. Of course, this planet is engaged in a war with their neighboring planet, and they have some unusual rules. The planet responds to the hell with a code 710, which means stay away from the planet. And Ambassador Fox should know what that means. He's an ambassador after all. The Ambassador is wrong here, of course, and Kirk is ready to uphold their request to no outside contact. The first point is lost here when the Ambassador pulls rank on Kirk. Of course, it would have been a much shorter episode. Fox has a valid point on why they need to contact the planet. The correct course of action would, of course, be to hammer out their plans B and C with Starfleet, and then ignore the Code 710 and get into big trouble. Kirk is like, oh shit, here we go again. Spock is fully versed in what to do when they have a stupid ambassador, and Kirk quotes from the movie Twister. Spock tells a little about the planet. In a nutshell, these planets are perfectly happy being in a 500 year long war with each other with no outside interference to stop them, and the Valiant disappearing 50 years ago is foreshadowing for what's going to happen next. Ambassador Fox clucks like a mother hen when Kirk says he's going down first to see if it's safe. The Ambassador really sucks at his job. He should know these things already. They should have had mass amounts of pre-planet meetings in the week it took to get here, but they didn't do it, so minus one point. Spock is concerned that the planet, who asked to be left alone, really hasn't made any type of contact with the ship at all, either positive or negative. They rarely say what type of phaser. Scuddy is in command, wishes Kirk a body trip. Fox is thinking, why can't I go too? And Scotty is like, yes. I wish you'd win also, then I don't have to deal with you. Here we take a second to admire the matte painting. And how does she know that? So, minus one point. They are to be treated correctly. How do you treat them incorrectly? Minus one more point here for both the commander and first officer beaming to the surface together. They're not supposed to do that. Kirk mentions the United Federation of Planets, and we learn this planet names their people just like they do in Logan's Run. Spock is pretty good at finding a good beam-down point, and remember, this is the Division of Control. We will get back to that later. Mia reminds them they were warned not to come, but they do believe in hospitality even if you ignore that. Of course, she is really up to something. And they do scene transitions just like they do in Star Wars. Kirk faces his promotion board. You can tell something is wrong right away. These two planets have been at war for 500 years and don't want any diplomatic relations with outsiders. No asking for help, or a mediator, medical supplies, or even bigger bombs. They don't want any of that. Something is wrong. Spock describes the planet as a happy one. Here is another red flag. He says the casualties among the civilians are 1 to 3 million. Shouldn't the military casualties be higher? But here, there are no military casualties. And here comes the attack. Even though this is a simulated attack, why can't they have simulated shelters? This war is simply a very unusual version of population control. We only get a brief glimpse of the war room. Shout out, Tamula is the first yeoman who isn't white, and she gets a ground mission as well. Ironically, when the yeoman are white, they don't get to do real Starfleet missions. It's always about a love interest with someone in the crew. Scotty also reports all quiet on a planet that just got hit by a fusion bomb. This is where the foreshadowing comes in. The Valiant was here 50 years ago, and the attack now is the same as it was then. Now we learn the deep dark secret of the Miniar. Their war is completely done by computer simulation, and people must report to disintegration chambers if they are calculated as killed in action. And with this attack, 500,000 have been killed, just like 50 years ago when the Valiant was here. So this attack was all Ambassador Fox's fault. No wonder they don't like spaceships orbiting the planet. And to get even, they count the Enterprise as destroyed, and they want to disintegrate the entire crew. Of course, they want to keep the ship for themselves. Maybe this whole war simulation is a hoax, so they can get free spaceships that happen to be wandering by. 
minus one point for the captain's log man explaining down to the audience about what happened before the commercials. It should be my landing party and I, so minus one point for bad English. Another point is lost here since Mia is also counted as a casualty, but why? Shouldn't everyone in the building be counted as casualties? Or did the fusion bomb hit her house and they go by residences? There is obviously a 500 year old glitch in the system. These people are so terrified of a real war they simply walk into suicide machines at a rate of 3 million a year. Back on the Enterprise, I will have to take one point from Mr. Scott. Since there has been no contact, and they know that transmission is a fake, they should have sent down a search party. Spock uses the power of the Force to get the guard to open the door. Kirk uses the judo chop he saw in Austin Powers. It looks like they are practicing a magic trick. One more point is lost here. Why are the security guards behind Kirk and Spock? Isn't it their job to protect the captain of the ship? Spock tells the guard there is a bug on his shoulder. I guess that's the logical thing to do. Security around the disintegration machines is pretty lax. Kirk again violates the Prime Directive by destroying the disintegration machine. This will cause chaos on both the planet. Anon 7's response is to destroy the Enterprise. Minus one point here, sound doesn't travel in space. It would be impossible for these sonic bombs to cause damage since there was no one in space to hear it. One point is lost here for continuity since firing with shields up is possible in most other shows. Ambassador Fox is no help at all. Doesn't his uniform make him look like one of the Antedians? Something tells me Ambassador Fox doesn't know what he's talking about. Scotty's idea of diplomacy would be much more fun to watch. Mia's outfit is nice. It shows some skin, but not overly provocative either. Spock says he has four disruptors and a communicator. It looks like he hounds out five disruptors, but one of them might be that communicator. The board contemplates liberalism. Ambassador Fox has no clue at diplomacy. Anon 7 is a really good bullshitter, a sign of a true diplomat. Scotty doesn't believe a word. These are very important words to live by, but Fox can't fit the bill either. Scotty stands his ground, which really pissed off the ambassador. Actually, Scotty is not taking orders from him. McCoy also doesn't buy the snow job story. McCoy stands up to the ambassador, but Fox pulls his imaginary rank on them. And Scotty pulls real rank on the ambassador. Ambassador Fox throws a temper tantrum and screams a list of threats at Scotty. But I don't think Scotty really gives a shit. Kirk and Ambassador Fox play a type of chess game crossed with fencing. Kirk does take a glass, but doesn't drink it. But I will have to take a point for him turning his back on a non seven so he can push the button. Kirk thinks the Enterprise is the Death Star. Now comes the big fight scene. And I think he lost. Here is proof that you can beam down with the shield up. Scotty is going to be pissed that the transporter operator sends Fox down to the surface. He's now thinking, maybe I should have listened to Scotty after all. He doesn't regret it at all, because Fox is the one that got them into all this mess to begin with. Spock makes contact with Scotty on the Enterprise. Spock authorized Tamula to sit on Maya. But unfortunately, we already had the one required fight in this episode, and this would be called a cat fight, which the censors would say no to. Isn't that sexist, allowing men to fight on TV and not women? This would have saved Star Trek from cancellation, that's for sure. Spock and the undercover security guards save the ambassador. I guess that's a good thing. Spock destroys another disintegration machine. This is Spock's way of politely telling Fox that he is a shit for brains. Yeah, I don't think anybody's gonna fall for this line. Kirk is correct on this statement, but they still have to follow the rules of the planet they are around not just break the rules, also known as breaking the Prime Directive, which is what Kirk does almost every episode. Kirk issues General Order 24 to Scotty. I think this is a bluff. Anon 7's bluff is really worthless. You don't threaten to kill off the ground crew if the rest of the ship doesn't come down to be killed. Here is Kirk's bluff. He threatens to kill everyone on the planet if they don't stop killing each other themselves. It doesn't make sense, so minus one point. Another point is lost here since Fox's aide gets shot and they just kind of leave him there and keep going. Vindicar is pissed. And seriously, this has to be a bluff. 
Anon 7 practices his swoon while Kirk zooms around the room in seconds and takes over. This is why they don't want a real war. Their army sucks. Kirk explains why they have been caught up in this clean war for the past 500 years. Spock programs the central computer to destroy itself, which breaks the treaty and starts a real war. Again, they broke the Prime Directive. Here is a long-winded speech on the horrors of war. And guess who gets to help put an end to it? Ambassador Fox. This might not be the better solution after all. Anon 7 and Fox go to contact Vindicar. Spock says there is a chance it will work. And Kirk calls Scotty and cancels the bluff of destroying the world. And everybody is happy. And in the final scene, they get a message from Fox stating all is going well on the surface. Of course, they don't verify it is actually him and not Anon 7 faking his voice because they've already killed him. Here is more philosophical banter on the horrors of war. And the last point is lost since like many episodes, this one ends with an insult to Spock. And the winner of the best lines in the episode award goes to Scotty. He only has a little screen time, but was able to punch in as many Scottish cliches as he could. Of course, it is possible no one in Scotland speaks like that. It could just be Hollywood's opinion on how they speak in Scotland. So, who were they? David Opatoshu has over 100 credits to his name. He was also in the Air Force in the South Pacific during World War II. Gene Lyons only had a short life, but he also was in a relationship with Grace Kelly. Barbara Babcock was also the voice of Trelane's mother in The Squire of Gothos. She has 100 screen credits and we will see her on Star Trek again. Miko Mayama was the first non-white yeoman. She didn't have a romance with anyone in the crew, but she did have one with Burt Reynolds. And this is the last time we will see Sean Kenny as DePaul, who was also Captain Pike. A Taste of Armageddon gets a whopping score of 86%. That's all for today. Click that like button, the share button, and the subscribe button, and I will see you again soon.